Wireless Land Professionals Podcast, Episode 195. I want everybody to know how to use Adrian's tool like Adrian knows how to use Adrian's tool. And in fact, maybe even better. Wireless Land Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless lands. This Wireless Land Professionals podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless land veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Welcome back to Wireless Land Professionals Podcast. My name is Keith Parsons, and today I'm with Devin Aiken. Devin's been in the industry forever. He, like, started the entire thing. And today I wanted to bring him on to talk a little about about his class called the Wireless Adjuster. Devin, how are you doing today? Yeah, doing great. And, hey, uh, I, I think uh, I figured out when I started in the industry. I think it was when dirt was invented. <laughs> Not not quite that old, but, but you're making me sound really old because I was old when you started. That's right. Let's just jump right in this wireless adjuster. Sure. And in the beginning, you were sitting around your back cave in the bottom of your house thinking there needs to be a new certification. <laughs> sitting around in, in the, my PJs, right? How, how did you actually come up with the idea that we needed a, a new vendor neutral certification? How did I come up with it? Well, I, th- I think it was maybe a, a divine providence, but, you know, I used a scanner all the time and I, I didn't know if other people were using scanners as much as I was, but I would say a minimum of 90% of my engagements, uh, consulting engagements, uh, design, validations, things like this, I was always going to a scanner. And I thought that was an interesting factoid that I, I pulled it out so much. And talking to a few other people, they, they didn't. And while scanners have been around for a long time, and there are some really stellar uh, scanners on the market, there was no real formal information training. There was just some random blogs here and there about the use of scanners. And so I decided to try to put together something that would make the education around use of a scanner much more formal and much more useful and much more organized. And so I was doing that and realized that there needs to be more to it than that. And so looking at the CWMP program, which you know I found I co-founded and trying to figure out, is there a need? Is this really something that fits into the uh, education program that we all know and love? And the answer was it fits. And so it, it's needed. And so I've turned it into a full-blown certification program rather than just a class. There's a certification behind it and so on. So how did I come up with it? It's simply the consulting practice showed me that I was using it for a lot of different tasks and in ways that are probably not very well known. Assessing algorithms, whether it be automatic channel of power or assessing load balancing algorithms, you can do all of this with a scanner. And yet a lot of folks don't know that. So here we are. Back before when we could travel, I used to run a series of Twitter posts. Whenever I was at a new airport, I would fire up a scanner, look at the scan results and then kind of evaluate every airport Wi-Fi as I went through. So I, I do see how you came up with that idea. It wasn't really my purpose in the beginning. It was more of a, hey, this is interesting. I keep using this over and over and the scanners are getting better and better and they're solving more and more problems. So should it be more formal training or is this always going to remain an informal tool? And of course, if you look across the industry, there are, there are uh, scanners for Mac and for PC. And some different vendors have it for both. And then, of course, you've got some on mobile platforms. And there's just this hodgepodge of, of products and nobody knows how they correlate, what each one can do, when they're useful, where do they fit in the design life cycle, uh, if at all. And yet I use them all the time. So this led me to the the logical conclusion that um, if nothing else, let's give it a try. You know, it's kind of like throwing wet noodles against the wall. Let's see what sticks. It's it's kind of like that. Let's see if this is going to stick. And already I'm seeing that it's sticking quite nicely. So I seem to have stumbled across a, a really nice opportunity to help the industry here. Let's talk about the stickiness of your noodles. <laughs> We're recording this in the middle of April 2020. You've been doing this for what, about two and a half, three months now? No, it's been a bit longer. The beta class, uh, trying to remember when that was exactly. It's the end of January. Yeah, all right. That's right. About four months. You're right. So yeah. from the launch of the beta, of course, the creation of the, the course and the exams, I've been working on this for 
I would say six solid months prior to the launch of the beta. So for me, it seems like much longer than it has been. But <laughs> <laughs> building courseware and exams, especially writing exams, is a unbelievably slow process, as you well know. Have been through it a couple times. You separated the course from the exam. Yes. When you attend the course, it's a two-day course. What's the ratio of sitting, listening to Devin speak, which is very good. You're a great lecture instructor versus the ratio of hands-on where the students are doing something in their own machine. It's 25% Devin talking and 75%, almost exactly 25% Devin talking, 75% lab time. That in the beginning was variable. I just didn't know. And, And so as it turns out, the first half of the first day is all discussion and lecture which means I'm teaching, the students are pitching in and feeding back and asking questions and posing alternative uh, viewpoints. And then the last half of the first day and the entire second day is all lab time. This runs on Mac, Windows, Linux as an option? You can bring whatever scanner you want to class. The one that I use to teach the class is Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, and I use a Mac because it's only for Mac. And then, of course, for PC, there's a couple of options, a couple of good options. Uh, One is WinFi Lite. The other is uh, Metageek's Insider 5 product. And of course, there are others. I mean, there's still several other scanners on the market. And if you choose to use those, you certainly can. I recommend those simply because they're the most capable that I've found. And certainly if other scanners become available that are capable of doing the labs that I do in the class, then I would recommend those as well. But for teaching purposes, I use a Mac and I use the Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. A lot of my students use WinFi, and some of them are starting to use Insider, and some use both. Actually, if they're Windows-based, a person who who likes Windows better, then they might often use both. It it allows them to do a a bit more, see a bit more, et cetera. Has anyone tried doing this with AirCheck G2 as their scanner tool? Uh, Not so far. The only alternative to my suggestions that I have seen is in the last online class, one of the students used both WinFi and a VM running Mac OS Catalina running Wi-Fi Explorer. So he was wanting to compare the two, but he was a Windows-based platform. So he had Mac OS, I don't know what you want to call that, but it's like Franken Mac OS, if you will, running inside of a VM. And he had a few issues here and there. For the most part, it was working for him. He wanted to see the differential, but that's the only real alternative that I've seen anybody try to use. Could they use the AirCheck G2? To some extent, they could. But there are labs where we want to connect to remote sensors and things like this, and the AirCheck G2 doesn't do that yet. So what can a student do if he wants to prepare before coming to your class? What do they need to know? What what can they study up on so they'll be ready? In the beginning, my hope was that this level two class, which is what we have on the market today, is level two. There will be a level one. We can discuss that maybe a little later in in this uh, podcast. But today, the level two is geared at post-CWNA students. If you've either attended a CWNA class or gone and gotten your certification, maybe you self-studied and got your certification, maybe you just have enough experience to where you didn't need to self-study, you could just go and take the test or, or you have that equivalent level of knowledge, you are ready for this class. I have seen students who are CWNEs. I've had quite a lot in the last nine classes that I've taught. I've had quite a lot of CWNEs. And I've also had a lot of CWNAs, those who have just gotten their CWNA and they're just starting to learn. The feedback uh, so far, if I just threw it all into one big bucket, of course, there's a variety of feedback. But in one big bucket, the feedback is that I hit the mark that this is post-CWNA. How far post-CWNA varies. But most folks agree that if you are just learning to spell Wi-Fi, this is probably not your class. That would be more the level one class that I'm going to put together here shortly. That's been kind of the prerequisite level of knowledge that is suggested. I have had one student that has said, I was in no way prepared for this class. I don't have CWNA. I'm very, fairly new. Maybe I could come back to the level one class and then repeat this one as an audit or something. I said, yeah, sure. I've had that happen with one student. Other than that, it's been okay because most of the students have met the, um, when I say most, I mean all but one, have met the requirements. 
at the end of the first day, you've had half a day of lecture, half a day of labs. Do you give them homework to do on their evening off? Only a little. Usually that depends on where we are. If we're hosting the class in a hotel, then I will have them all look at the hotel's network and pick out three items that they think don't meet the best practice we discussed in day one. On online, you can do the same thing. Just have them evaluate their own home. Sure, they certainly can. And so I, I, ha- I didn't do that in the online class that uh, I recently taught, but there's no reason we can't do that. The homework is minimal, but it's it's usually fun and it's almost always funny because, you know, hotel networks, right? It's always hodgepodge. Sometimes they're OK. Sometimes they're really awful. When I give them a list of three between the entire class, they usually come back with eight to ten total. Yeah, there's just the tiniest bit of homework after day one. Too bad that you can't give that list to the hotel and have them actually improve. <laughs> I, I found they don't want to see those lists. That's right. They don't care. You know, it's one thing to hand them to the front desk of a hotel because they really don't care. They don't know, understand or care. But even if you handed it to those that are supposed to care, oftentimes they don't care either. And they think, who is this clown giving me this feedback? I know Wi-Fi. And so what do you do? You can lead a horse to water, they say. Yeah. You come to class, you have a little lecture, a lot of hands-on labs. At the end of the second day, do you hold the exam in class or is that something people take later? That's a complex question. Easy answer, complex question. Here's my thought process in deciding on what to do on that. The simple answer is it is taken online later. You can take it right at the end of the class if you want. There's nothing stopping you if you want to hang out and and take the test, but it's taken online. There were two major options in the market that we see a lot. The first is a proctored exam through Pearson View or Prometric or somebody like that. That is a very expensive option. When I say very expensive, let me give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Having co-founded CWMP and run it for better part of a decade, they want 50,000 bucks. If you can't just pay up front, They'll take the first $50,000 you get, put it in their pocket. Anything over that per year, then you get to keep. (laughs) And so obviously, for the first few years, uh, that would be a losing proposition. And if you don't make 50000 bucks, you have to pay them the rest. That is only really applicable, as we learned at CWP, applicable to very large certification programs. And it's difficult. We were doing that with both Pearson View and Prometric for a long time, shelling out 100000 bucks a year. It was very difficult to make a living like that. That one was off the table immediately. The second option is to do a practicum right in class, similar to your ECSE classes, where you host the test, whether it's practical or it's multiple choice or whatever format you choose, you host it right in class under the instructor's watchful eye. That is certainly an option. It's just not the option that I wanted to go with. The reason for that is I feel like in tests like that, there may be a false expectation of passing. The instructor wants you to pass because it reflects on their teaching if you don't. They have an incentive to help you pass or to go to whatever length it takes to make sure everybody passes every class. And I didn't want that either. I wanted the chance that that students can fail so that the certification has some amount of diligence to it. Now, you can make the strong argument, obviously, that if you take it online, you could cheat. That is a possibility. Nobody's proctoring. So there are limitations I've put in place. You can take this test online at exam.wirelessadjuster.com. There's time limits. Right now, there's no practice tests, which makes it even harder. There's nothing to give you an idea of what's on the exam other than the published exam objectives, which I certainly have. Those are on the website. Those give you a list of all the topics. Right now, I'm finding that the feedback is that it's a you know wonderful test, but my opinion, it's a little bit different than the feedback I'm getting, and that is it's a little too easy. Well, you, you would think that. Well, yes, but I'm basing it on statistics, not on my opinion. Too many people are passing? Yes, and so let me give you an idea from my CWP days of what, of what I'm talking about. Going back to CWMP, Kevin and I did a, Kevin Sandlin, my co-founder, and I did a little bit of analysis on passing scores. There were times during the decade that we were running this thing that we would have people complaining that a certain exam, whether it be CWAP or CWSP or whatever it is, CWNA, is too hard. Then other times people would complain it's too easy. Neither of those are good things from a perception standpoint, right? You want people to say, well, it was difficult, but it was fair. That's what you're looking for, Um, because if it's difficult but fair, it means when you pass, you fairly passed and others have to do the same so that the certification itself has value to you and to the industry. 
So what we looked at was what are these average passing scores when people are complaining versus uh, when they're not. And oddly, um, it is a very small point swing to make people go to the too easy side versus the too hard side. So we found that the almost perfect score, average score for CWNA was between 68 and 69 percent. So if the average score was 68 to 69, um, this meant everybody stopped complaining. People were passing and people were failing, but very few feedback of this test is awful and it's too hard or it's too easy. But if you would go up even to 70 percent, that's just one point. People would start saying this is way too easy. It needs to be harder. And then, of course, if you go down to 67 percent, you would see people saying this is way too hard. Nobody could pass this test, blah, blah, blah. Oddly enough, that one point swing in either direction from that 68 to 69 was a, sh a shocking thing. I was like, really? It matters that much? So the current, I don't actually have it in front of me, but I can tell you that the average score um, right now for the wireless adjuster is actually around the mid to high 70s, which means statistically it's too easy. Now, I've, I've had some people fail. Uh, I, absolutely. Some of those people came to my class. Well, very few of those people came to the class. I've only had a couple fail that came to the class, two, I think. The others that failed did not come to the class. And even still, the people who came to the class that retook it scored very high the second time around. They were in the high 80s and low 90s the second time around. My guess is it's a little too easy. Some people will fail due to not being good test takers. Some will fail due to not taking the class or having adequate preparation or you know having the proper background before they got into the class. Just looking at the stats only, it's probably too easy, but I'm going to leave it alone just for a time. I want to get more data. I've only got so many people in my data set right now to make that call. You're one of the best statisticians that I know, and you love the data. You've told me several times you need more data in your data set to make a call like that, and that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm giving it some time to collect more data. You also have a non-random sample, because everyone who came to your class was at least post-CWNA. Yes, that's true. I mean, I, I publish all of that publicly. Hey, don't don't come to the class unless you have this level of knowledge. And so I don't want just any average Joe that just learned to play with a home Wi-Fi router yesterday to come to this class because they would have a false expectation. I want to actually help them learn. Leading on that, let's talk about level one, level two, and maybe is there going to be a level three? Level two is all that exists today. Level one is definitely on the radar. I know exactly what will be in it. We had a lot of folks across two beta classes, and the feedback consensus was we need a level one. That is a, a class that has more of the CWS, CWT type of prerequisite level of knowledge to come to the class. Now, who would it be geared toward this level one? Folks that work at, let's say, carriers, for example, AT&T, Verizon, things like this, they come to your home. They're going to set up your home router, maybe has Wi-Fi. They need to understand a few basic principles of Wi-Fi, and they probably do. But at this point, they will learn to use a scanner to learn to assess and validate that their configuration is what it should be. They will learn best practice configuration, a little bit of troubleshooting. It would be a lower level technically than the level two. So there wouldn't be as many best practices addressed the labs would not be as complicated. I'll say it that way. That's probably the right word is complicated or sophisticated. The labs would be brought down a level. When is it coming? I've been trying to make that determination. I think I finally come up with a decision on that. When somebody actually asks for it, I'll build it. <laughs> uh, it won't take me very long to build it. I mean, I will be taking the level two material. We'll use the word rejiggering. I will be going through it, removing the harder parts, redoing some of the labs, taking out some of the best practices, slowing down the timetables, because when you're at that level, you need to go a little slower. How long would that take me to do? It'd probably take me two weeks of work to get everything not only rewritten, but also tested and, and tested for remote access and things like this as well. When's it coming? As soon as a, a company calls me and says, hey, we got X number of people we want to put through one of these classes. Well, immediately it's worth my time. So I would immediately set aside the time and do it right then. So far, nothing. Regarding level three, that hasn't hit the radar just yet. I think I have an idea of where it would be as far as tools go. The number one tool I would be looking at is one from MetaGeek. It's a visualization tool called IPA. I'm sure you're very familiar. We'll call it a halfway between a Wireshark and a scanner, in my opinion. It does a lot of visual analysis, things like this. That's where I think it should go if we tried to go upstream. But this has to do with where the, the answer to, you know, what's going on with the level three or am I 
my thinking about that, really has to do with how this program fits uh, alongside or even not really within, but at least alongside the CWMP program. Today, the CWMP program has two holes that I see. Now, I love the CWMP program. I wholeheartedly endorse them and promote them at every opportunity. I don't look at my program, the wireless adjuster program, as a competitor in any shape, form, or fashion. In fact, it's something that would assist those who are trying to get their CWMP certifications. And here's the holes that I see. You could even consider it to be one whole. It's just in two parts. When you get your CWNA certification or that level of knowledge and you want to move up a level into the professional, there are currently four certification levels there. The analysis professional, CWAP, there's the security professional, CWSP, the design professional, CWDP, and some new one that I haven't even looked into yet. I don't know if you know what that one is or not, but it doesn't really bubble up for me to address with the wireless gesture program. Here's how the wireless adjuster fits into that. The CWSP and the CWAP, there's a very much a hands-on gap between CWNA and those two certifications, CWAP and CWSP. You don't get enough of best practice assessment, best practice knowledge, and then of course remediation and troubleshooting and use of, we'll call it lightweight tools, not going all the way into protocol analyzers, and troubleshooting packet by packet because that's what they should be addressing. But when you go from the CWNA level and you're studying for your CWAP or your CWSP, what tools do you use to see what security measures are my network using? Are they configured properly? Do I have TKIP enabled or WEP? Do I have uh, certain other performance parameters? Maybe CWAP will address performance, security, and other things as well at the, uh, the protocol level. And so which tools do you run to? Well, if you don't understand Wireshark or any of the other tools like it, the OmniPeaks or a Wi-Fi Analyzer Pros, well, what do you do? You've kind of got a very big hands-on gap there. Well, the scanner is the first place you run. It does a lightweight best practice and configuration analysis. The gap that this program fills sits between CWNA and those two uh, CWMP certifications for the purpose of hands-on experience and moving you toward those two certifications. I don't want anybody to take CWNA and then get frustrated and say this CWSP or this CWAP is it's just too much, it's too hard, it, tools are complex and they're expensive. Well, what if we had inexpensive tools and you could take baby steps forward until you get there? Well, that would be much preferable. And therefore, the wireless adjuster program inserts or fits right alongside between the CWNA and those professional level certs. And one thing I've noticed, I sat the beta a couple of times with you, which is great, by the way. I uh, appreciate that. You make a scanner do more than what most people do. It basically, <laughs> in fact, if the scanner didn't have the ability to do packet capture and at least look in detail in the beacons, half your class would go away. It's, it's, it's taking the scanners to the max. Y yes, I, I completely agree. It was uh, quite funny. Um, Landon Foster, I uh, hope he doesn't mind me mentioning him here. Uh, he's a good friend. He uh, sent me something on a DM recently after taking the class. And his exact quote, I just pulled it up. His exact quote was, you will the scanner's butter knife like a scalpel. Uh, truly impressive. Basically saying the same thing you just did is that I take a tool that most people know one, two, three features and teach them to use it like the software designer knows how to use it. If you're talking about Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, I want everybody to know how to use Adrian's tool like Adrian knows how to use Adrian's tool. And in fact, maybe even better. And the reason is because Adrian's a developer and he's not out doing field engineering all the time. So he may not know all of the use cases of his tool. To give you an example of that, one use that I tripped across, actually, I wasn't expecting to use it this way. I was at a, a high school gym. This gym held 3,500 people. I mean, that's a big gym. Uh, the fire code said 3,500 people. They were having a basketball game when I was there validating. We only had six APs in the gym, six APs. The reason is because the school did not have the funds to have all the APs they wanted. So they bought as many as they could, and the gymnasium was last on the priority list. Whatever was left over went in the gym. We had six APs, and we needed way more than that, you know, 16 to 18 APs there. Well, we didn't have them. So we turned them on, and this basketball game was happening. I was validating, and I pulled out a scanner, and I was standing there at the door, and I noticed they only had two SSIDs. One was their corporate, and one was for their students and their guests. And I noticed the students and guests 
Uh, SSID, when I expanded it out, the association counts at 64, 63, 64, 64, 63, you know, 59. And then one of them said seven, uh, seven associations. And now these APs weren't spaced way out. They were, you know, spaced modestly. Think about that. Two issues you can see from this. The first thing is the maximum association counts for those SSIDs, or you could say BSSIDs, were 64. And of course, they needed to be far higher than that. And the channel utilization was modest, so you could actually turn those up. And then secondly, 7, 64, 64, 63, 59, 7? That means the load balancing algorithm was either not configured properly or not acting properly. There are things that you can infer from the scanner, whether it be a lack of PoE power or load balancing algorithms or uh, DFS algorithms. There's all kind of behaviors that the scanner lets you watch if you know what you're looking for. It's those things the classes wrap students' head around is here's all these use cases. Here's all these scenarios. What are we looking for? What are we looking at? What could you infer from looking at this? We try to place some logic along the lines of using the scanner. So yes, like a scalpel instead of a butter knife. Kudos to you for digging in. If the scanners don't have the ability to see inside a packet, there's a whole bunch of things you can't infer. That's right. So it depends on the frames you're talking about. Scanners, for the most part, depends on the scanner, but for the most part, scanners are designed to look at probe responses and beacons. Now, you think, well, that's just a small subset of all the frames that are involved in Wi-Fi, and that's true. There are action frames and other management frames and control frames of various types, and certainly the data frames. You've got AMSDUs and AMPDUs and quas null MPDUs and so on and so forth. But a huge amount of information about the wireless LAN, its operation, and what's going on is announced in the beacons and probe responses. The number of associations, how busy the medium is, the channel, which channels are being used, the configuration of the platform, what your neighbors are doing, all that is there. Even whether protection mechanisms like RTS-CTS are being used by clients, it's all there. You may only have two frames, but there's a lot of information in those two frames. One thing I learned in the class is the differentiation between beacons and probe responses don't always act the same. You know, that is an unfortunate truth. I didn't realize this myself for a while. I just assumed that vendors were doing things right. You should not make those kinds of assumptions. The time I found it, I was at a school system and I was watching the names of the APs, which were populated in the configuration of the controller. They were popping in and popping out of my scanner. I pinged Adrian and said, hey, I think your scanner has a bug. And he said, no, you're using this certain vendor's equipment uh, for the infrastructure. And I went, how would you know that? He said, it's their problem. I said, how is that? He goes, they're not putting all of the fields into the probe responses that are in the beacons, including the name of the AP. When the scanner refreshes, let's say you have it in active mode and it's getting both beacons and probe responses, when it gets one or the other, it updates. So what happens, these fields and their values pop in and pop out based on the differential between the beacons and the probe responses. Now, this differential doesn't exist across all vendors. Some vendors fully populate the probe responses, but lots of vendors do not. So if you want to see all the fields, you might have to put it in passive mode. Passive mode is a terminology for using a monitor mode for the driver, which means it listens only, which means you can only get beacons, which you know gives you a different subset of information in your scanner. The first time I noticed that, it was like, why is this changing? Right. When I just assumed all the vendors did it were following the rules. Because of that, I went back to the standard. I've been reading the standard for 20 years and a little more than 20 years, and there's some assumptions that it hasn't changed that I should question from time to time. I learned early on, way back in the early 2000s, that beacons and probe responses should be identical with the exception of the TIM field, traffic indication map field. And of course, I still believe that. So I wanted to go back, uh, and I did this recently, and make sure that's still true. Is, is that true? I brought these documents up and went through them field by field. I believe there's like 64 fields and it's still true. It's still exactly true. The TIM field is the only differential, but in the real world, it's not that way. A lot of vendors, for whatever reasons they've chosen, they do not fully populate probe responses when they absolutely should. Well, that's just one of the many subtle and some not so subtle things you learn in Devin Aiken's wireless adjuster class. Before we end up here, Devin, what do you want to say about if someone's thinking, oh, I might want to come to this wireless adjuster class, give me your elevator speech to get someone to come. <laughs> 
If you have the prerequisite level of knowledge, let's call it a CWNA level of knowledge, and you're looking to enhance that knowledge in a hands-on, practical way where you can do a best practice assessment, you have to know what the best practices are for various vertical markets and various scenarios to be able to assess those best practices, to be able to uh, know what to do to remediate those best practices if, in fact, the system is not configured the way that you know it should be. And then, of course, to use the same tools for troubleshooting, lightweight, inexpensive of tools that have a short learning curve, this will be very beneficial. A lot of folks reach for hyper sophisticated tools that cost a lot of money. We'll call those a scapel when a butter knife will do. A Swiss army knife has lots of tools. Each one of them may be small, but they all do a wonderful job together. That's what a scanner is. It's like a, a Swiss army knife. Reaching for whether it be survey tools or design tools or protocol analysis tools, things like this, those are for more sophisticated scenarios. I mean, certainly you can't use a scanner to design a network. Uh, you can't use a scanner to do a very good survey. But if you want to do a best practice assessment, nothing is better than scanners. It's fast. It's easy. And I tell my students the goal of the class when you finish the class is one thing. I just want you to be able to do one thing. And that is when you go to your customer site and you open up your laptop and open up your scanner app is to be able to go, nope, nope, yep, nope, nope, yep, done to be able to assess that network in seconds at the worst minutes versus being there for days doing a survey that would only tell you things are bad when you already know things are bad going in. Right tool for the job, not just use the scanners, but also the opposite. Use the survey tools, use the planning tools when that's the appropriate tool for the job. That was a long elevator ride. Yeah, I could have just said right tool for the job, um, <coughs> but the scanner fits about 90 percentile uh, of use cases. And it's an amazing thing. So you you started out doing live classes, then because of the coronavirus and the travel restrictions, you've now moved online. What are the couple of things you changed between, or if anything, between the live class where you're in the room in a hotel and when, what you do online? There had to be a few changes. There was just no way around this. When we're in class, everyone can connect to my WLAN Pi as a sensor right over the network that I build in class. I build a wireless network and a wired network with the ACP servers and all that right in class. The Wi-Fi Explorer Pro tool can connect to WLAN Pi, and I can have all of the students in the class connect at one time to one WLAN Pi. So it's quite easy to use that for the remote. One shortcoming with the other apps, the Windows-based apps, is it's a one-to-one -one relationship of, let's say, WinFi to a WLAN Pi. It's one-to-one -one using SSH connection. For that reason, I can either have an entire room <laughs> full of WLAN Pis or I would have to let those folks who use WinFi or Insider use pre-captures, which means I had to set everything up for the live labs because I have both canned labs or pre-configured labs and live labs. For those folks who can't get a remote connection in, I've already pre-captured those live labs, but the experience is very similar. The only difference is, is you're not pulling from a remote connection. So certainly I had to rejigger a little bit of that. But the students did all the same exercises, right? Yes, the exercises are the same with the exception that we don't require for the remote class, we don't require the USB connected WLAN Pi. If the students want to do that and they have a WLAN Pi, they can connect. So we give them a chance to do that. But it's not a necessary lab. It's just something that we talk about that is capable and why would you want to use it? Things like this. Instead, we use the remote connectivity into my lab. I've got WLAN Pi set up and they can connect uh, over IP or domain name into my lab and see everything remotely. That was pretty easy on my end to set up, so it didn't require too much changing. How will someone go about finding wireless adjuster classes in the calendar for your online version? They can go to wirelessadjuster.com to find and to register for classes. They can go to exam.wirelessadjuster.com to take the exam. I'm having a new website built right now that will be under the wireless adjuster domain, but right now that domain, just wirelessadjuster.com, redirects over to my uh, Divergent Dynamics, which is my company. It's website to where you can sign up and look at the schedule for online and for in-person classes. I expect the in-person classes to crank back up in June. Like everybody else, 
when the coronavirus thing started, pretty much everybody canceled everything. All consulting, speaking events, classes, everything went to zero in about 10 seconds. Rejiggered everything for the online classes, and that seems to be going pretty well. I've got another one coming up uh, next week. I will start back doing the in-person classes in June if all goes well, provided travel is allowed and other countries let me in. Going forward past that, I'm going to go ahead and maintain the online classes as an option. There will be some countries either can't go to or there's not enough people asking for the certification. They can always attend the online. So I'm going to keep both the online and the in-person classes going forward. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate your time. Sure. It was good to hear from you and to realize the water stressor is growing and getting bigger and better. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, pretty pleased with how things are going. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless Land Professionals Podcast. The podcast for wireless land professionals by wireless land professionals. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless Land Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi.